So glad to see you today. Thank you for coming. And welcome to White Oak Baptist Church. We'd like to extend a special welcome to our visitors. Call your attention to uh, connection cards that you should find in front of you in the pews. If you're new to us, this is your first visit with us. Take a moment to fill those out. You can drop it in one of the offering boxes, two in the back, one to the side here. And we're happy to uh, connect with you. And thank you again for coming. A couple of announcements. Next Saturday is our ladies' luncheon. It's entitled Gifts of Grace, and there's some cards there explaining it, and there's sign-up sheets on the console table that is right behind the back wall. Please sign up, and that's at June 3rd, 11.30 a.m. here at White Oak down in the Fellowship Hall, and all women are welcome. We'd love to have you, and I hope that you can join the ladies for that special event. Call your attention to a couple other announcements. We have our regular series of... um, Fellowships, life groups this week. We meet twice a month. And so tonight, 5.30, at the uh, Rings home, we have uh, one of our groups that meet. You're welcome to come to that. On Wednesday, we have the group that meets at my home. Well, it's my wife's house. I just kind of hang out there. (laughs) And also on Wednesday evening, we have the group that is meeting at Sam and Tricia Lewis's house and also Rick and Suzanne's home right here on Bradley Boulevard. So... Our life groups up and running, new content, new study. Happy to have you at any one of these. You'd be more than welcome to come to any one of those. Uh, mention a couple of things. Our new opportunities for giving, if you'll see on the back panel, the tithes and offerings you can now give through our offering boxes here, obviously, traditionally. And also, our website has a giving um, donation portal. And you can now give by text, right out of your smartphone, just text. In other words, we will accept your offerings in any way you wish to bring them, (laughs) including wheelbarrows of pennies. Just bring bring your offering. We're happy to do that. We're going to ask our ladies ensemble to come and uh, lead us in an opening call to worship.
Before we go to prayer, we have a couple of things we'd like to mention, special prayer requests. Some of you have perhaps noted that Lois Kennedy has not been with us for a while, and she is moving back to Columbia to be near with her uh, children, and she'll be uh, moving into an assisted living uh, complex there in Columbia. So as you think of it, please pray, pray for Lois, and we're certainly thankful for the months that she spent with us and her good contribution to the life of this flock. And so be in prayer for Lois as she makes that transition. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. How we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the love divine that excels all other loves. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your house with God's people and for the unspeakable privilege of going before your throne of grace in prayer. We lift up Lois and ask that you would be pleased to give great grace and strength to her and bless her son and daughter as they help her make this transition. And I pray, Father, for your hand of healing upon her and that you might uh, keep her in good health and in good spirits and may she receive good spiritual nourishment uh, where she is. Father, we thank you for this group. We thank you for our visitors who are with us today. We praise you for them and we ask that you would meet the needs of their lives and hearts through the preaching of the word of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit and applying that word. Father, we thank you for this Memorial Day holiday. We do thank you for the men and women of this country in particular who have given their last full measure of devotion that we might enjoy the liberties we have. And we pray, Father, that you would meet the needs of those servicemen and women who are protecting us now, and we thank you for them. Father, we come before you asking that you would forgive us of our sins. And Father, you've told us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us and that we actually make God a liar. And Father, we claim the promises that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we claim that promise and confessing and begging your forgiveness for those things we did this week that we should not have done. And we beg your forgiveness for not doing what we should have done. And we beg your forgiveness for presumptuous sins that simply came in and out of our radar so quickly we don't even recall them. And Father, help us to go back to the cross of Calvary and understand what was at stake as Jesus took our sins upon himself and bore them in his body on the tree. And Father, we thank you that he ever lives to intercede for us. And we thank you that we come before your throne of grace through that great and marvelous and wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray that today, in this service, and at White Oak Baptist Church always, that name would be precious to us because it is the name that is above every name. And Father, we know that all creation in heaven, in earth, and under the earth, will bow and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. May we do so today. May we humble ourselves, bow our heads and our hearts with grateful thanksgiving to the marvelous Savior and coming King, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.
pray for our offerings. Father, God, great giver of all good gifts and giver of your son, we come to you this morning to present our gifts to you. They're, they're small, they're paltry, they're meaningless in light of the incredible gifts you've given to us, and yet, God, you say you love a cheerful giver. God, it makes you smile when we give out of the things that you've given to us because I think it reflects your heart. God, thank you for the gift of your son as we just sang. God, we come to you as those who thirst and Jesus is the water of life who satisfies. God, we come to you as those who fear and are weak. God, and yet Jesus is our strength and Jesus is our shield, our trust. God, we, we come to you as those, some here may be lost without Christ, and others of us feel acutely that we were lost, and if it weren't for your grace and the gift of your Son, we would still be lost, and Christ is our Savior. God, Jesus Christ is the all-sufficient one. His sacrifice pays for every sin we could ever commit. God, his righteousness is sufficient so that we may stand clothed in its and your righteousness, and we may stand before you, and you see Christ, and God, so thank you so much for being the great giver. God, thank you for being the all-sufficient one. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.
Our scripture reading today comes from John chapter 8, verses 12 through 30. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But, do you, but you do not know where I came from, nor where I am going. So you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself, since he says, Where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you, you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he, was, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And he was saying these things, many believed in him. him.
Thanks to all who participated in the music. We appreciate it very much. If you have your Bibles, please turn, first of all, to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. In the Pew Bible, that's page 955. We will return in a moment to Deuteronomy chapter 9, which is our primary text for the week. Much has been written in secular terms and in faith terms about the concept of leadership. I'm always intrigued when I read an article that says the top 25 books of 2023 on leadership. Like, I didn't know there were top 25 books, but those of you who study leadership to any degree know that you couldn't fill this auditorium with the books on leadership that have been written in the last century. And there are many definitions of leadership out there, but there's one common denominator in all the secular definitions of leadership. And that common denominator is the term influence. That leadership is a process of influence. And that you know leadership happens when a group of people have been influenced in either attitude or action. And that influence is supposed to be geared towards some type of mutually agreed upon goal or vision. In Christian terms then, Spiritual leadership from spiritual leaders exists as a process of influence toward the goal of Christ-likeness in the flock, of people being brought closer to the image of God through the image of Christ, of people having Christ formed in them. Now, there's much else to say about leadership, but Peter says some good things about it in 1 Peter 5 in the first four verses preparatory to our study in Deuteronomy chapter nine. Peter says, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. All right, let's stop there. He's talking about the term elder. That is the first of three terms the New Testament utilizes for what I think is one office. The first term he uses is elder. And notice here he does not claim authority as an apostle. In this passage he's saying, I'm talking to you who are elders in the church, those of you who are pastoring churches in modern terms. And I'm speaking to you as one who is a fellow elder. I'm not speaking to you in apostolic authoritative terms. We have the second term in verse two, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. And now we have the third term, exercising oversight. Shepherd is, we get the word pastor from that term shepherd. So you have elder and you have shepherd. The third term is brought about by that term oversight. The term there is overseer. The King James traditionally translates that as bishop. And an overseer is someone who sees over. It's the idea of actually taking care of the flock of God. So you have elder, you have pastor, and you have overseer. Now these people do this because you're to shepherd the flock of God that is among you. This is not my church per se. Now in vernacular, I will tell people I pastor this church and I'll refer to you as my church and I might refer to you as my flock just by way of introduction to what I do. But in real terms, I am not the pastor of my flock. I am the under shepherd of God's flock. You belong to Christ. And I've been called by God's grace to minister to you, and I think in these three capacities, as elder, as shepherd, and as overseer. But notice these restrictions. These men are not to do this under compulsion. No one makes you do it, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain. Let's pause there, see how many pastors are getting rich? More than you'd think, and there's more kinds of gain than money. You do not do it for shameful gain, but you do it eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples of the flock. That's the primary basis for which we have influence is the concept of example. You're supposed to be examples 
of the flock if you're called to this ministry. And when the chief shepherd appears, Jesus Christ, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. This is a promise to faithful elders. Now, one of the things that elders, pastors, overseers do is intercede for the flock. And the office of intercession is part of the great high priestly office of Jesus Christ. This chief shepherd, this supreme shepherd, not only provides us the ultimate example for Christ-likeness and godliness, this chief shepherd provides the example for all under shepherds of what it means to intercede for the flock of God. You go to the throne of grace and you plead God's mercy and grace and goodness on this flock. Now let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter nine. In one of the really great chapters about intercession, we're going to find certain things out. For the sake of our visitors, I mentioned a couple of things. You, we had a lengthy passage from John 9. We are in the process of, as a church, on Sunday mornings reading through the Gospel of John, so we have some fairly sizable chunks that may or may not relate to the message, but I always find more often than not, they do. And you'll also notice that we're seeking to memorize as a flock uh, the first epistle of John, and so we have that divided into uh, two verses per week, and I hope that you're making some progress there. And we're now in Deuteronomy. This is our 11th message in the book of Deuteronomy, and we're in chapter nine. Let's read this chapter. It'll take a little bit, but it's God's word. It's important. Moses is writing here, more literally speaking, and someone is probably recording it, and this is one of the sermons, or part of one of the sermons that he's preaching to the people of Israel on the plains of Moab before they go in to take possession of the land. Hear Israel, you are now about to cross the Jordan to go in and dispossess nations greater and stronger than you with large cities that have walls up to the sky. The people are strong and tall, Anakites. You know about them and have heard it said, who can stand up against the Anakites? But be assured today that the Lord your God is the one who goes across ahead of you like a devouring fire. He will destroy them. He will subdue them before you, and you will drive them out and annihilate them quickly as the Lord has promised you. After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you, it is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going to in to take possession of their land, but on account of the wickedness of the nations, these nations. The Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess, for you are a stiff-necked people. Let's pause and talk about stiff-necked. Um, it's a phrase that comes to us probably from uh, the world of cattle. It may refer specifically to an ox or a bull that's in harness, and the strength of that animal is in its neck, and when he decides to be stiff-necked, it's difficult to turn. On a smaller scale, maybe you've had a dog like this. You know, he used to have a dog, and if he didn't want to go, we, we wanted him to go, we'd have him, you know, on a leash, and you'd drag him. He would dig his feet into the carpet or on the floor, stiffen his necks, neck, and basically say, I will go, but under compulsion, I will not help you. You must drag me. I am stiff-necked. That's kind of what's going on in this passage. It's like God can obviously make them do what he wants them to do, but in this case, he's receiving no assistance from them. They are stubborn and willful. Verse seven, remember this and never forget how you arouse the anger of the Lord your God in the wilderness. Now let's pause here for a second. When he says you, this generation is the generation that did not sin initially, 
that generation passed on. They were essentially the dross that was refined out. But he is linking them to their ancestors much in the same way that we are linked to our fleshly father, Adam. We still have within us the capacity to sin as our forefathers sinned. From the day that you, you left Egypt until you arrived here, you have been a rebellious, you have been rebellious against the Lord. At Horeb, Sinai, you aroused the Lord's wrath so that he was angry enough to destroy you. When I went up on the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant the Lord had made with you, I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. You can read about this in Exodus 30 through 32. I ate no bread, drank no water. The Lord gave me two stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. On them were all the commandments the Lord proclaimed to you on the mountain out of the fire on the day of the assembly. At the end of the 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord gave me two stone tablets, the tablets of the covenant. Then the Lord told me, go down from here at once because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt, your people. They have turned away quickly from what I commanded them and have made an idol for themselves. And the Lord said to me, I have seen this people and they are a stiff-necked people indeed. Let me alone so that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven and I will make you into a nation stronger and more numerous than they. So I turned and went down from the mountain while it was ablaze with fire and the two tablets of the covenant were in my hands. When I looked, I saw that you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made for yourselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way that the Lord had commanded you. So I took the two tablets and threw them out of my hands, breaking them to pieces before your eyes. An obvious visual symbol, the covenant was broken. Then once again, I fell prostrate before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. Now we're getting into now 80 days, 80 nights, before the Lord with no food or water. I ate no bread, drank no water because of all the sin you had committed, doing what was evil in the Lord's sight and so arousing his anger. I fear the anger and wrath of the Lord for he was angry enough with you to destroy you. But again, the Lord listened to me and the Lord was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him. But at the time, at time I prayed for Aaron too. Also, I took that sinful thing of yours, the calf you had made, and burned it in the fire. Then I crushed it and ground it to powder as fine as dust and threw the dust into a stream that flowed down the mountain. You also made the Lord angry at Taborah, at Massa, and at Kibroth Hatavah. And when the Lord sent you out from Kadesh Barnea, he said, go up and possess, take possession of the land I have given you. But you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You did not trust him or obey him. You have been rebellious against the Lord ever since I have known you. He's uh, making friends and uh, influencing people. I lay prostrate before the Lord for those 40 days and 40 nights because the Lord had said he would destroy you. I prayed to the Lord and said, Sovereign Lord, do not destroy your people, your own inheritance that you redeemed by your great power and brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Overlook the stubbornness of this people, their wickedness and their sin. Otherwise, the country from which you brought us will say, because the Lord was not able to take them into the land he had promised them, and because he hated them, he brought them out to put them to death in the wilderness but they are your people, your inheritance that you brought out by your great power and your outstretched arm. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote about prayer. It is the highest activity of the human soul and therefore it is at the same time the ultimate test of a man's true spiritual condition. There is nothing that tells the truth about us as Christian people so much as our prayer life. Ultimately, therefore, a man discovers the real condition of his spiritual life when he examines himself in private, when he is alone with God. And have we not all known what it is to find that somehow we have less to say to God when we are alone than when we were in the presence of others? It should not be so, but it often is so that it is when we have left the realm of activity
activities and outward dealings with other people and are alone with God that we really know where we stand in a spiritual sense. Well, Moses knew where he stood. What does this passage tell us about intercession? We'll get to that in a moment, but what does this passage tell us about spiritual leaders? What kinds of activities should encompass their days? What kinds of things should they have in the forefront of their thinking? The first thing this passage teaches us, and it teaches us many things, is that spiritual leaders, people like Moses, tell their people the truth. You say, well, that should be a duh. It is not a duh. I hate to say it, and my heart breaks to say it, there are pulpits filled with men all over this country and around the world who are right now engaged in not telling their people the truth. They're telling their people a lie that will damn their souls to hell. And I'm telling you the truth. That's what's going on. He tells people the truth, first of all, about God. What do we learn about God in this passage? What have we learned about God in Deuteronomy? He tells people the truth that God is a personal God. We're not dealing with a force. We're not dealing with a concept. We are dealing with Yahweh, the Lord God. That is his personal name, the great I am. And part of what preaching is supposed to do and what pastoring is supposed to do privately as well as publicly is this. Introduce you to your God. Who is he? What is he like? What does he say? What is he doing? What are his characteristics? Folks, sometimes it's just good to get alone with God and think about God. What is he like? He's personal. This passage shows us that he has great power. We know God is an all-powerful God. He can do anything he chooses to do, and nothing can stop his will. We also see this as a providing God, is he not? Does he not give these people food to eat? Does he not give them shelter? Does he not keep their clothes from wearing out, their shoes from wearing out? Does he not indeed feed them with manna from heaven? He provided, 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 provided all through these wilderness years, and still so many of them did not acknowledge him as he truly is. Is he not a passionate God? Does this passage not introduce us to a God who can be merciful, but who also can be wrath? Folks, we have to take God as he is in the scriptures, and we stress he's a God of love, and we stress he's a God of mercy, and we stress that he's a God of grace, and we should, and we always should, but we cannot pick and choose the attributes of God. And this God with whom we have come to deal is a God of holiness. He is absolutely perfectly holy. There is no sin about him. There is no darkness about him. And part of that holiness is a divine wrath against sin. But he's very patient, is he not? Patient. Patient with the Amalekites. Patient with all the other tribes that dwell in the Holy Land, giving them hundreds of years to repent and turn to him. Patient with this stiff-necked, rebellious people. Patient with you, patient with me, long-suffering with you, and more than long-suffering with me. He's a patient God. So much more we could say, but we'll leave it at that. Spiritual leaders tell people the truth. They tell people the truth about God, and they tell people the truth about themselves. The scripture talks about a people having itching ears. That there's going to come a time when preaching is going to have to be, what do these people think they want, and how can I satisfy that itch? And I hate to say it, and I, and I don't mean to come across as negative in this message, but I hate to say it, there are preachers who do that. They take their text from your felt needs. And that's a lousy way to pick a text. First of all, what are your needs? I'll tell you what the truth is about your needs. If you have food and raiment, there would be what? Content. Nothing else is a need. Nothing else is a biblical need, including your self-esteem. Including your self-esteem. Now, folks, to the best of my ability, and as I understand the scriptures, I'm telling you the truth. If you have food and raiment, you can be content. Everything else is peripheral, unessential. 
It really is. And the reason why we have problems with self-esteem is because we do not esteem God enough. Our dwelling is not on him, our dwelling is on us. Folks, there is nothing good that dwells in your flesh, absolutely nothing. Why ponder it? Why think about it? And why make it the thing that drives your choices? Why not allow the God of heaven, this holy, good, patient, long-suffering God, be the one who drives your, drives your so-called needs and wants? We are not always righteous in actions or character. We don't walk according to who we are really in Christ. Paul has to write entire letters to the, to the Corinthians, to the Galatians, to do what? Correct their bad behavior, correct their bad thinking. And the Apostle Paul, as loving and long-suffering as he was as a pastor, has to say, I do not commend you. I speak this to your shame. Folks, if your pastor is not giving you biblical correction where the word of God gives correction, he's not a faithful pastor. He is not. Now, we can go overboard and turn every church service into some kind of a harangue and lay guilt trips on everybody all the time. That's not biblical preaching either. But folks, we do have a thing called the law. And this law is righteous and good and holy. And we're not saved by keeping the law. We are saved in order to keep the law as revealed by God. We are indeed prone like this people to rebellion, to stubbornness. I know I am. But this is really the key element of sin. We are prone to idolatry. More about that in a moment. But also there's a competing truth, maybe even a superseding truth. You are God's people. Prone to wander, Lord we feel it. Prone to leave the God we love. But we are God's people. This passage tells us what the New Testament tells us, that his people are his inheritance his special people. In 2 Peter, or 1 Peter 2, same book we looked at a moment ago, the apostle tells us in verses 9 and 10, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. I love the King James, a peculiar people. I'm always reminded of that phrase that comes from Eudora Welty's short story, The Petrified Man, referring to somebody who said, this, they said, this guy's peculiar. Well, is he, is he ha-ha funny? Or is he ha-ha peculiar or funny peculiar? You know, there's sometimes when Christians are just ha-ha peculiar. You know, like we just are weird for weird sake. That's not what God has in mind. We are peculiar in the sense that our translation says, we are people of his own possession. Exactly what Moses said to God about the people of Israel. And he goes on to say, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So there's a duality of biblical preaching from spiritual leaders. And that duality is we tell you what you're really like in the flesh and we fight it tooth and nail. And we mortify it, as the old Puritans said. And then we also declare to you who you are in Christ. Redeemed, born again, bought back from the slavery of sin. You're now God's people, his royal priesthood, his own peculiar possession. You are sons and daughters of the king. Are you prone to wander as sons and daughters of the king? Yeah, I am. Pastor, did you live a sinless life this week? I did not. And I'm not saying that joyously. I'm saying that out of shame. I didn't live a perfect life this week. Much I have to confess before God. But thanks be to God, he's my father and he hears me. And thanks be to God, my sin is not resulting in condemnation because there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. My sin has interrupted my good and true fellowship with my Father, just as you might sin against your Father. And it might interrupt, bring a tinge to that relationship temporarily, but it does not alter the fundamental relationship. 
You are God's child in Jesus Christ if you've confessed your sins and turned to him and nothing, nothing, nothing changes that. And less than that is not the truth. And the truth also is we tell the truth about what you're like, we tell the truth about what God is like, we also tell the truth about the circumstances. Moses didn't mince words here because God didn't. They're gonna fight a great enemy. These guys are powerful. They have huge walled cities. It's like you went with, you know, you went against Og and Bashan and all those people. Minor leagues, minor leagues. You now are being, you now are facing, you know, like LeBron James. You're now facing Otani. Are you familiar with uh, the, the great player from the Angels, Otani, Japanese? He plays every day. He's one of the best pitchers in the American League, and he's one of the best hitters in the American League, and he does both at once. He has totally eclipsed anything Babe Ruth ever did. Like, when you go against Otani, you're in the major leagues now. You know, I think my brother reminds me of this sometimes. When he's first a youth pastor in Ohio, there was a Christian school there. Christian school, like a lot of Christian schools, had a basketball team. And my brother and I played for a very large uh, high school program in Indiana. And we had, you know, a pretty, pretty uh, strong basketball team. These kids in his youth group are all in the church. They're talking like, yeah, Pastor Sam, like, we're number one. We're so great. We're so good. Man, we could beat anybody. My brother just finally just said, you know, there isn't one of you who would sit the bench on my high school team. What? No. None of you are any good compared to anybody that I played high school basketball with. Get off your high horse here. Why was he doing that? He's telling them the truth. You're really not that good. Okay? Stop thinking of yourself as special. Is that not what God did? You all think you're special. I'm telling you, I'm not clearing out the land just because of your righteousness. In fact, I'm not clearing out the land because of your righteousness at all. I made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'm going to keep it. Your righteousness has nothing to do with it. Spiritual leaders tell us the truth about circumstances. And part of those circumstances are this. You, on a regular basis, through the scriptures, are called to do that which is humanly impossible. And that's the point. You are called to do that which is, humanly speaking, impossible. Pray without ceasing. What? I've mentioned before the one that scares every groom that I've ever talked to to death. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. I'm out. No way. See you. Nice service. Bye-bye. That's spiritually impossible to love your wife like Christ loved the church. And that's the point. You go with... Do that like you do anything else in the power of the Holy Spirit and through the power of God's grace because you are his child. We tell people the truth about God, about themselves, and about circumstances. Secondly, this passage shows us that spiritual leaders must hate sin. They must hate it, and spiritual leaders must view sin, as do all Christians, as God views sin. And God views sin as lawlessness, as rebellion against him. And any sin you commit, even the ones we joke about, are sins that are committed by people who literally are standing, stiff-necked, fist in air, defying God to his face. He said, I don't remember ever doing that. That's what the heart does when it sins. It says, God, you are not deserving of my obedience, and you're not gonna get it. And spiritual leaders recognize that some of these sins are presumptuous sins disguised as worship. Now let's go back to Exodus 32, the original place where the golden calf passage is. First three verses, the people are clamoring to Aaron. Moses is up on the mountain. We don't know what's happened to this guy. You need to make us some gods. Verse four, Exodus 32. And he, Aaron, received the gold from their hand, all their earrings and stuff, and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. Now, first of all, this took some time. You gotta melt this gold, let this gold cool. You gotta take this big old lump of gold and you start fashioning it into a calf. 
And they said, these are your gods. It can be translated, this is your God. A golden calf. But the story almost gets worse. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This calf was invented just a few minutes ago. How could it have brought us out of the land of Egypt? Verse 5, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord, all caps in your King James, a feast to Jehovah, a feast to Yahweh. I've got this golden calf that I fashioned, likened to all kinds of golden calves or calves of various kinds that are pagan gods of the people. And I build an actual altar in front of it and I declare a feast to this calf and I call it a feast to Yahweh. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, to revel. It's been a good day to be in the Lord's house. Let's go to Golden Corral and have a good time. And we just worshiped a golden calf and we called it God. Folks, I'm telling you the truth, and I'm not lying. How many church services are conducted in such a way as to say, we are worshiping Yahweh, but we will worship him out of our own flesh, and we will borrow all the things from the world that we can borrow to accomplish that worship. But we're okay It's in the name of the Lord. I love what Daniel Block says about this. But the rebellion at Horeb represents a particularly sinister form of idolatry. This is syncretism at its cleverest, the amalgamation of religions. In his dedication speech, Aaron had declared, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt, constructed an altar before it, and then announced the following day, as a holiday, a festival to the Lord. The words and actions appear orthodox, but the form is entirely pagan and in direct violation of Yahweh's explicit command. This is a serious and pervasive problem in Western worship. He's talking about the United States, places in the West, Canada, England. Even the worship of evangelicals with their high claims to regeneration and new birth and authentic Christianity We are quick to declare our love for God, but we hate his law. We are passionate in our expressions of worship, but we refuse to ask him what kind of worship pleases him. Instead, we take our idioms from the pagans around us. We claim new life in Christ, but then we replace Christianity with a fertility religion, perverting slogans like God has a wonderful plan for your life into a health and wealth gospel. We take God's good gifts and corrupt ourselves by making idols out of them. We have forgotten that true worship involves reverential acts of homage and submission before the divine sovereign in response to his gracious revelation of himself and in accordance to his will. Now, does that mean we don't sing any form of music that is Western music? No. Does that mean that we aren't dressed as most people in the West are dressed today? No. What it means is you are here to worship the one true God and we need to be careful that we're worshiping him as his word dictates and we do not allow his worship to be influenced unduly by those mores of the world. And why do we do that? These people were afraid, these people were fearful, these people were rebellious and they demanded that something be made with which they were familiar. And they had to be able to see it, and they had to be able to touch it, and they had to be able to bow down before it visibly. Now, I'm not gonna go through a plethora of things that perhaps even I have preached on that really was borrowed from the culture. I'm as bad as anybody else about that if I'm not careful. 
But I am saying, without getting into this highly prescriptive language here, we as White Oak Baptist Church must be sure we're worshiping Yahweh as Yahweh has commanded and not as the world dictates. And that's why we are very careful about our choices here. Not because we want to be unduly conservative, whatever that means. We want to be holy as he is holy, and we want that to translate into a worship that is holy. And finally, and most importantly here, I think, or at least as important, spiritual leaders must intercede for God's people. One pastor put it this way, intercession is not a ministry done from a place of strength and competence, but always as a desperate sinner praying for fellow desperate sinners. We identify with those we pray for because we are just like them. Moses was just like the people. Oh, not in so many ways. He was a man who was indeed after God's own heart in some ways like David was. But he was a man of flesh. He was a man prone to anger. He was a man tempted by sin. He was not God himself. And he understood that. But Moses, first of all, prayed selflessly. He prayed for his people and not for his own self-aggrandizement. What did the Lord say? Let me alone. Let me destroy these people. I'm going to blot them out from the name of the earth. But notice this promise. This is from the lips of God himself. And I will make you into a nation stronger and more numerous than they. Moses, get out of my way. I'm going to wipe them out, and you're the new Abraham. I'm starting over. Now let's don't gloss this. This is Moses on his face before God, interceding for this sinful people that they not be destroyed. And this God says to him in no uncertain terms, get out of my way, I will make you Abraham. Now is that temptation? Can't call it that, comes from God himself, he doesn't tempt man. But internally, does Moses give this some thought? Apparently, he didn't give it much thought because not only did he pray selflessly, he prayed sacrificially. He spent 40 additional days before the Lord on his face begging God. He prayed boldly, Father, don't do this. He's literally talking to God and saying, God, you can't do this thing. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. Who are you to go before God and tell him you can't do something? But what is he telling him? You can't do this thing because you are a just God and you know what you said. And these are your people and they are your flock and you said you were going to lead them and not destroy them. And I'm begging you, Father, to keep your word. Oh, Moses was put to the test, really put to the test. And he came forth as gold here because he said, Lord, in essence, I can't let you do that. And I'm begging you for your people. And this passage has convicted me like no other passage I've ever preached on has convicted me. I don't pray for you like that, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Oh, I pray for you all the time. I pray for you by name all the time. But I just wonder, have I ever gone before you in this manner, on my face before the living God and begging him, begging him to sustain you by his grace? Oh, there's all kinds of things we can pray for in terms of intercession. We don't have time to cover them all. But when you pray for me, and I believe you do, how about 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, and 3? We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope 
in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. And then he follows that up in chapter five, verse 25. Brethren, pray for us. In what way? This same way. This same way. I'm not super saint. The deacons of these churches are not, this church is not, are not super saints. We are flesh and blood, prone to wander, like all of you are. Pray for us as we pray for you. I would say pray for us even more than we pray for you. How about giving us opportunity to actually preach? Colossians 4, with all, praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance, the King James says, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. When you pray for me, yeah, I've got physical needs. Knees are wearing out. That's okay. I'll get new ones. But this is what I need, that I might be able to make Christ manifest, that I might be able to speak to you as I ought to speak. That I ought to speak with boldness, that I ought to speak with grace. And how do I pray for you? I pray that the, 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 the monstrous Satan of this world, more powerful than the Anakites, with minions to do his will, who wants to devour you as a lion devours its prey, who wants to sneak up behind you, who wants to deceive you, I pray that you'll put on that whole armor of God that you'll know what it means to stand against Satan and his wiles and that you withhold him by the power of the word and watch him flee from you. I love this picture I think I shared with you a couple years ago. I like nature shows. My wife hates nature shows. I like a nature show. Now there's one animal that lions fight, hunt, that they're really very cautious about, and that's the Cape buffalo. The Cape buffalo is the one time when the males go out with the females and hunt, because they know they got something. This is, this is roll up your lion sleeves, we got a job, it's a Cape buffalo. And they are dangerous animals. And I saw this one, it was so interesting. This pride of lions was going out, they had this herd surrounded, and they were trying to pick off Cape buffalo, and suddenly this two or three huge bulls just turned and just charged those lions, absolutely charged at them, and like kittens, these lions literally scurried up this tree. And there's this Cape buffalo, munch, munch, munch on the grass beneath that tree, and there's this lion, four or five lions sitting there on the limbs like, well, I got nothing, you know. And I thought about that. You say, well, Satan acts like that? The scripture says he does. The scripture says that when you stand against him in the power of the Lord and in his might, he flees. Because you have on the armor of God. One of my prayers for you is that you will understand in Christ who you really are and that you will be removed from fear, that fear will be cast aside. I pray that when you have anxiety that you'll cast them on Christ who cares for you. I pray that when you have anxiety that you will come to him in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving and that the peace of God would guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I pray that you might be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I pray that you might know to the fullest capacity who it is that you serve and who it is who fills you. In short, I pray that Christ will be formed in you. That's the kind of thing Moses wanted. He lays before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights after having been deprived of food and sleep for 40 days and 40 nights, and he begs the living God to preserve his peculiar people. And do you believe God hears and answers prayer? I believe he does. Oh, Satan wants you to be, a, he wants you to be afraid. He wants you to be fearful. He wants you to look at your flesh. He wants you to look inside for help. He wants you to look to the world for help. He wants you to go anywhere else but the throne of grace for help. And he wants you to be insecure. And he wants you to be self-absorbed. And he wants you to be influenced by the mores and, and the gilded 
age that we live in. But you don't have to be. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And Moses knew that. And Moses knew these mighty giant people with their walled towers were as grasshoppers before the Lord. Proverbial ants. You say, well, sometimes I feel defeated. Sometimes I feel like Christianity is not really working that way. All right, let me ask you. Who built this church? I don't mean White Oak. I mean this church as part of the great church. Who's building that church? Say it with me. Jesus is building that church. And what did he say would prevail against it? Nothing will prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Everything that God has promised you in his word about what you're going to be and already are spiritually has been fulfilled, done deal. And part of strength in faith is to live in the reality of who you really are, a kingdom of priests unto God. Prone to wander? Oh, wow. Lord, I feel it. A kingdom of priests unto God helped me to feel that too. And may that great truth of God's grace overwhelm me. And may the things of earth grow what? Say it with me. Strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's pray. Father, we're about to take communion. And in taking communion, we are declaring that we are united with you and that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Help us to take this communion with great satisfaction, knowing who we are, who we serve, and help us, Father, to live out what it means to be a kingdom of priests unto God. In Jesus' name, before his sake, amen. Let me say as we begin that our visitors here, if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you've had come to saving faith in him, we invite you to share communion with us. We don't practice closed communion. It's not for church members only. If you're here and you know the Lord Jesus Christ, we invite you to the table. And we also want to say that we celebrate that union we have with Christ that's also manifested in the union we have with each other. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we celebrate that. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Help us to take this bread and this cup reverently, but joyously, in Jesus' name, amen.
bit of bread represents the body of Christ, and he's told us that this bread represents the body which was broken for us, and this we do in remembrance of him. Of course, this juice represents the blood of Christ, which Christ describes as the blood of the new covenant, the New Testament, which is shed for many. And he also promised that he was not going to drink of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God, which I assume to be with us. And until then, this we do in remembrance of him. When they had sung a hymn, they went out. Jeff is gonna lead us in a couple of stanzas, and as soon as that hymn is over, you are dismissed. God bless you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful Lord's Day.